Okay. And then I'm going to make you back the presenter. Unfortunately, I think Hank has to get back in. Oh, I see. Oh, here he is. Okay. Oh, I'm going to make Hank the organizer. Okay. Sorry. Are you seeing my screen yet? Uh, yes, I can see your screen. Good. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Sorry. Sorry, Hank. <laughs> well, not a problem. Sherry, we can start whenever you're ready to start. I think everybody okay. should be, um, we have about 42 attendees. Okay. And uh, we're just about to hit 10 o'clock. So, yeah, we can okay. start anytime. Okay. You want me to get started? Sure. Um, it's up to, if you want to wait a couple more minutes. People are logging okay. in. Sure, let me yeah. just wait. I got 10 o'clock. Let's just wait a couple more seconds. Yeah. Sure. That's fine. And then, Hank, when you want me to advance, just say next slide. That'll work. Okay. Sh Sherry, you should be able to, you're advancing your own slides, correct? Yes, but since he's starting off as the moderator. Uh, okay. Okay. And Hank, will you be launching the poll questions, or would you like me to launch them? Could you do that? Because I, I don't know how to do it. Okay, that's fine. So, I mean, it, if it's simple, I could do it. But, I mean, if there's some back-end thing that I have to click or something, I've never done that. So. Yeah, no, you uh, no, you just have to click on the – select the poll question and, and click launch. But I can do it. if. Sounds good. All right. So why don't we get started? It's 10 um, good morning, everyone, uh, and thank you for participating in the, the New Jersey Statewide Network uh, for Cultural Competency, or NJSNCC, webinar. Uh, the NJSNCC includes a network of over 130 organizations and agencies, and its mission is to facilitate access to equitable and quality services for individuals, families, and communities through culturally and linguistically appropriate service delivery. One of our activities is to offer webinars on a variety of topics in the fall and in the spring. Today's webinar uh, is titled Unconscious Bias, Uncovering Our Blind Spots. And in this presentation, we hope that you will learn more about unconscious bias and how it affects daily interactions uh, in your everyday lives and decision making such as hiring, etc. Uh, my name is Hank Dahlman, and I uh, am an instructor in the Department of Family Medicine at the Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School and also director of the New Brunswick Community Interpreter Project. Uh, I'll be today's moderator. Uh, but before I begin, I'd just like to address a few housekeeping issues. Because of the number of participants that we have today, your telephone lines will be muted throughout the call. However, using the webinar technology, you can submit questions at any point during the presentation via the chat or questions box on your webinar console. You can send the questions at any time during the presentation, and I'll compile a list of the questions, and they, we will do our, our best to address them. Uh, we're going to take a break in the middle uh, and uh, at the end, so there'll be time sort of halfway through and then at the end to address questions. Uh, please note that we may not be able to answer uh, every question, uh, and we may combine some of the questions into one. Uh, additionally, this webinar will be recorded and archived on the NJSNCC website. Finally, a short survey will pop up on your screen immediately following the webinar. Your feedback is important to us, and we appreciate you taking the time to fill it out. Now, I'm honored to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, the speaker is Cherie Wilson. She is currently the Director of Diversity and Inclusion at the Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital. 
Sheree is also a subject matter expert in diversity and inclusion and cultural and linguistic competence, uh, health equity. Uh, she is multilingual. Um, she is a, a great person. Uh, and I think the one thing that will be clear uh, through the webinar is that Cherie really uh, lives what she preaches. She practices what she preaches. Um, and so now it's an honor for me to hand over uh, to Cherie so she can start the, the webinar. Cherie? Great. Thank you very much, Hank. Good morning, everyone. Today's objectives are that we will identify unconscious bias as an element of cultural competence. As Hank mentioned, we'll discuss how unconscious bias works in everyday life. We'll examine microaggressions, stereotypes, and assumptions. And before we end, I will provide some tips for combating unconscious bias. So what do we even mean by the term cultural competence? Let me start off by what cultural competence is not. It's not simply attending our NJSNCC webinar or going to a conference or inserting three slides into a diversity and inclusion presentation. It's actually a process that evolves over time. I kind of call it a lifelong learning process. And even for those of us who work in the field, we are constantly learning as well because as we all know, culture is dynamic. Cultural competence affects individuals, organizations, as well as systems, and all of them have various levels of awareness, knowledge, and skills. And there is a cultural competence continuum that I'm not going to get into right now, but that's from the National Center for Cultural Competence at um, Georgetown University. So, when we talk about diversity, let's talk about a few of the dimensions. So I like to start with the inner circle, our identity. And I often ask people, what is one of the very first things that is assigned to you at birth? And it's your name. And I ask people, well, how do you feel if people constantly mispronounce your name, they provide you with a nickname, say if your name is Christopher or Michael and you're always called Chris or Mike and that's not what your preferred name is, or what if you're someone who has an ethnic name, meaning you have an Asian name perhaps, and your name might be Wei Jung, and I decide I can't pronounce Wei Jung, so I'm just going to call you Anne. So you're basically tearing apart part of someone's primary identity. Next, we move to the next circle, which is primary. These are oftentimes the things we can see externally. Sometimes they're even physical characteristics. So when we meet someone for the first time, these are things that we pretty much automatically notice, and we can make assumptions about people based upon these things. So if you look at someone and you assume that is an older person or a more senior person versus a younger, perhaps more inexper inexperienced person. Or if we're looking at one's uh, able-bodied status, mental versus physical. I oftentimes use the example, have you ever seen someone get out of a disabled parking space and you thought, well, wait a minute, that person's not deserving, I think that person is fraudulently using that disabled handicap tag because that person's moving too well. Well, we don't actually know what that person has going on. We often can be incorrect in our assumptions, so when we're trying to identify someone's gender or gender identity, and even race or ethnicity. The next level, or secondary level, these are oftentimes things that you really don't know about a person until you get engaged in conversation. I often say if you walk into a coffee shop and you see two people sitting at a table, oftentimes people will say, well, I don't think those two people have anything in common. But once you start having a conversation, oh, okay, you're from my same hometown or my state. We went to the same university. Uh, these are all things that you don't find out until you have conversation. From an organizational level, we know that um, regardless of what field you're trained in, we tend to be trained in silos. And once you actually get into the workplace, we can become very high hierarchical. So does one work for a union? Are you at the lowest level of the organization, the custodian versus the CEO? How long have you actually been within the organization? Are you management or a professional or a senior leader or an entry-level person? These are all things that we can still have things in common, but oftentimes they're used to divide individuals. And then from a cultural perspective, we all come, I, I basically consider every single interaction a cross-cultural interaction. Something as simple as a greeting. How do we typically greet someone the first time? Do you wave to someone? Do you shake a hand? Do you nod a head? Do you bow? Do you kiss? These are all different aspects of culture. And one thing I want everyone to remain cognizant of is that every single person has a culture and belongs to multiple cultural or diverse groups. So I use an example of a black female who is a lesbian, who is a military vet from the Air Force, who is married with two children with a traumatic brain injury. That's a single person. And those are all aspects of who she is. 
and when we interact with her, we can't make an assumption about her without knowing more about her. So culture overall, as I said, I consider every single interaction to be cross-cultural because everything that that person is bringing, whether we want to call it baggage or whatnot, that person brings that, the other person does, and then basically you have communication, but the way someone conveys something may not be the same way that it's, that it's perceived or received. So basically, as I said, we belong to multiple cultural groups, and culture affects everything, whether it's one's time-orientedness, whether it's how you exchange readings, whether it's what language you happen to speak, whether it's what culture, what customs you happen to follow during a holiday, or what holidays you happen to celebrate at all. And we typically think of this in terms of race, ethnicity, religion, one's socioeconomic status, disability or political group, but it extends to sec uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, what, what geographic location you're located in, so are you in an urban environment versus a rural environment versus a suburban environment. And oftentimes this culture is transmitted to succeeding generations. And as I mentioned previously, it is not static, it definitely changes over time and is dynamic. So I like to use this iceberg analogy of culture. Uh, basically, the things that are above the waterline, those are those external features, again, the things we notice when we first meet someone, so someone's age, your gender, your perceived race or ethnicity, and your physical or able-bodied status. But again, it's those things under the surface, beneath the waterline, that you really can't tell just by simply looking at someone. So as we proceed on our discussion of unconscious bias, keep some of these things in mind and think of how do you treat someone based upon external appearances. So for I know we're all coming from a variety of backgrounds, social services, working for various state departments, health and human services, healthcare agencies, but since I work in the healthcare field I just wanted to put a plug in, is we have a number of national studies that show significant disparities in both access and quality of care. And the reason why this is extremely important, many of us think that unconscious bias has something to do with that. So for those of you working in healthcare, please keep this in the back of your mind. And from a quality perspective, one thing that I find a bit disheartening is that if you look on the left, this is showing how we were doing with quality measures through 2012. The green is showing areas in which we were doing worse, and what we see is there are the greatest gaps between those who are poor versus high income. The blue is the areas in which we're doing the same, and the, I'm sorry, the green is where we're actually getting worse, and the black is where we're getting better. So you saw some progress, but the latest report that this year, referring to the year 2014, we've actually become quite stagnant. So in many of our areas, there's just no change. We've really plateaued. So we still have a lot of work to be done. So let's turn to what actually is unconscious bias. So this is a term that has been around for the last 20 years. It was coined by Drs. Anthony Greenwald and M.R. Banaji and their team at Harvard, the University of Virginia, and the University of Washington. And what they hypothesize is that oftentimes the way we act is not always under our conscious control. And we tend to use the terms unconscious bias, hidden bias, or implicit bias interchangeably. So oftentimes the way we act is really uh, geared by stereotypes that we learn from a very, very young age. And when you think of where do we learn about other kinds of people, Think of the media, think of our schools, our families, our neighborhoods, literature. I mean, basically, if certain people are portrayed in a certain way, no matter if you come from another country, you basically start to internalize those stereotypes as well. So how do we actually apply unconscious bias? Well, as human beings, we tend to categorize everything. So whether it's botany, we categorize flowers and insects and plants. Well, we do this to people as well. And we tend to put you in a certain box. So, okay, are you a millennial? Are you a baby boomer? So what age are you? What race or ethnicity are you? And I always say on forms because we know that they go far beyond what's on a form. But for forms purposes, we have the five races. And are you Hispanic or Latino? What is your role in society? So are you a homemaker? Are you a CEO? Are you a police officer? Are you a teacher? But what happens is, is once someone is actually mapped into a certain category, it's very difficult to break that person out of that category. I like to use that example. When you meet someone for the first time and you know, you're really not, you don't feel you have anything in common or you really dislike that person, and then later on you develop a relationship with that person and your attitude or your feelings about that person change, it takes a really long time to build trust with someone like that 
and to actually move that person from the category of, no, this is not someone I have anything in common with, to, oh, no, I think we can be colleagues and friends. So first impressions matter. How do we typically size people up? So oftentimes we will look at someone and make judgments based upon one's appearance. So I like to use the example, would one go jewelry shopping, so high-end jewelry in yoga pants or sweatpants or you've just come from the gym or you were out gardening? Because if you did that, I think the salesperson would automatically assume you don't have enough money to buy that diamond ring you were looking for. This applies to many areas of retail. Or if someone is perceived to be an older person and you're in the workplace, what assumptions do we make? Do we make assumptions such as, oh, that person's checked out of the workplace, that person doesn't know anything about technology, that person is just here collecting a paycheck? But conversely, if you perceive someone to be young and inexperienced, oh, this person's a recent college grad, this person has nothing to contribute, why would I want to listen to a millennial? So we really do size people up immediately upon meeting them for the first time. So I'm sure you've heard this question, how long do you have to make a first impression? Well, that time frame gets shorter and shorter, and right now it's about seven seconds. So when we're talking about all the different aspects of culture and diversity, we're basically taking all that in and within seven seconds making a very split judgment about a person. So we're going to go through these next couple slides, and we're going to look at a combination of photos and a combination of names, and we're going to try to figure out what can we figure out about that person based upon a name or appearance. So I'll start with the first picture. And we're going to go ahead and activate our first poll, Nancy. If you looked at this young lady, what would you think about her? So when looking at this picture, which of the following do you think apply? And you can choose one. Is she a millennial? Is she college educated? Black? Affluent? Or happy? Okay, so can we provide our responses to the poll? Oh, um... I think there's something that says make poll public. Oh. I can... You want me to just read them? Yeah. Uh, Go I said, ahead, sure. Some, I don't know what happened here. The, um, oh, you know what I did? Okay, share. Sorry. Okay, great. Thank sorry. You, thank you. Apologize. Okay, no. No, great. Thank you, Nancy. So, in our first impression of looking at this young lady, so almost a quarter thought that she was a millennial, a quarter thought she was college educated, 10% black, 2% affluent, and almost 39% happy. Thank you, Nancy. So, with that in mind, if I then told you that her name is actually Monica Sony, would your perception of this young lady change? And when she actually has to complete a form and check a box, she officially checks racially and ethnically. She checks that she's both black and Asian, but if we actually got a little more granular or drilled down and she really had to self-identify, she would identify as Jamaican and Asian Indian. Now, some other comments that people have made, and that's why we used the uh, responses provided, many people thought that perhaps she was a millennial because she, they would perceive her to be a younger person. She has a beautiful smile. So some people had said, well, you know, dental care is very expensive, and people who tend to have nicer teeth tend to be more affluent. So, again, things to keep in mind. Let me move to the next one. So, if you saw the name Sarah O, and Nancy, can you activate the poll, please? Great. So when looking at the name Sarah O, which of the following do you think apply? Asian, female, Sarah is a nickname, or the last name O is fake, or not her real last name. Great, thank you, Nancy. So let's see, 34% uh, thought that Sarah O is Asian, 58% female, that Sarah is a nickname, and that the last name is fake. Thank you, Nancy. So, first, Sarah is the white woman on the right of this picture. Sarah is married to the gentleman in the middle who is Burmese. 
And what Sarah hears very frequently is that, oh, O cannot possibly be a real name. In Burma, it is actually equivalent to the last name Smith, so it's an extremely popular last name. And sometimes when people see this, the name Sarah O, oh, they do assume she's Asian, but is that her real first name? Because remember at the beginning I said when you take someone's name and sometimes if you can't pronounce it, you shorten it, you use a different name that's just easier for you to pronounce. So something to take into consideration. But also in looking at this picture, think of if I had put this picture up first and I didn't show you a name. And I asked, well, who belongs with whom in this picture? Some people have looked at this picture and said, well, the one woman on the left who's leaning on the guy in the middle, maybe those two are together. Maybe actually the woman on the left and Sarah on the right, maybe their partners are married. Maybe this is an office party and they've had a little bit too much to drink or this is a wedding reception. So again, we can look at this situation and come to multiple different conclusions. So now we have the name Nigel. And Nancy, yes, thank you. So if you saw the name Nigel, which of the following do you think applies? that Nigel is English or Welsh, Australian, Jamaican, affluent, or perhaps speaks with an accent. Great, thank you, Nancy. So 44% thought that Nigel is either English or Welsh, only 8% Australian, 18% Jamaican, 4% affluent, and then a little over a quarter speaks with an accent. Great. Thank you, Nancy. So this is actually Nigel. This is my son. And um, Nancy, we had a picture, right, associated with the webinar? Uh, yes, a picture of you, yes. Okay. So <laughs> I am a black woman, two black parents. My husband happens to be white, and this is our biracial son, Nigel. The reason why I like to use Nigel as an example is if I just put his picture up and not his name, people are, oh, he's really cute. Oh, he's playing lacrosse, so his family must be affluent. But the fact of the matter is, is when he was born and we were being discharged from the hospital, I looked at his newborn identification form, and he was actually eyeballed and listed as black. So I asked the nurses, I said, well, wait a minute, why did you put him down as black? My white husband caught him. Well, I'm sorry, we just used the race of the mother. So... Sometimes infants are abducted, and if there was an all points bulletin put out or a silver alert or an amber alert saying an infant black male has been abducted, do you think they would be out there looking for my son, Nigel? Probably not. So again, something to consider. And then the next name is Dr. Jean O'Brien or Dr. Jean O'Brien. So if you looked at the name, which of the following do you think apply? Is this a male? Is it a female? Irish? French? A physician? Great. So, thank you, Nancy. So, 6% thought it was male, 21% female, 38% Irish, 2% French. 34% of physician. Great. Thank you, Nancy. So this is actually Dr. Jean O'Brien, although this could be Jean O'Brien. And this is a professor at the University of Minnesota. And what's interesting is, is that Dr. O'Brien is perceived to be um, a white American, but she actually is white earth Ojibwa. She's actually American Indian, and her area of expertise is American Indian history. So again, this is an example of how one's name can be treated. And regarding the doctor, she's actually not a medical doctor or a physician at all. She is a history professor, so she has a doctorate in history. So what did you see first? You can see our last poll. Did you see a young woman or an old woman? Ah, so, yes, 82% saw a young woman versus 18% who saw an old woman. So if we look at this picture again, 
does this mean that we place higher value on younger people versus older people? And it would be interesting because I didn't want to put an option in there, you saw both, because there's one that jumps out first. But again, perceptions, and what do we see? So we're going to take a little break, and we're going to break this up, and I think Hank is going to review a few of your questions. Um, we actually we haven't gotten very uh, any questions at this point based on uh, just some comments on the on the pictures um, that it might be uh, you know it could be all of them uh, and then a technical comment uh, so maybe at this point why don't we just keep going and maybe some questions will come in and we'll just sort of recycle this time at the end uh, to address questions that might that will hopefully come in at the second point and remember that you can use the uh, the, the, the chat or the questions um, part in your webinar panel to send in any questions or comments uh, as we go. Great. Just a quick reminder. Okay, thank you, Hank. So we'll continue. So here we're going to discuss a couple of examples of how unconscious bias works in everyday life. So in this case, the homeless and how we interact with the homeless. So I have two uh, short anecdotes about this. So this happens to be a homeless gentleman sleeping on the steps of a church. A new pastor visited his new church for the first time on a Sunday morning. And he wanted to see how his uh, flock, his parishioners, would treat a homeless person if that person actually came into their church. So he walked in. He was a bit disheveled. He, didn't, he wasn't dressed the nicest. And the people in his congregation, some avoided eye contact. Many were very rude. He sat in the front pew, and he was directed to sit at the back of the church. And in fact, several people just wanted him to leave altogether. Now, the deacons were actually in on this little stunt. And when they announced, oh, good morning, everyone. Let's, let's welcome our new minister, Reverend so-and-so. And he walked down the middle aisle of the church. Imagine how those in his congregation felt. A similar story is a new hospital CEO. He figured he'd do a similar type of experiment, and he was starting new in the position on a Monday. And that Friday, he went into the emergency department of his hospital. And he, too, was disheveled, didn't look that clean, and he was treated very shabbily, waited an extremely long time. People were rude, disrespectful. And he returned that Monday morning dressed to the nines as the hospital CEO. And you can think about how the um, employees who were in the ER that Friday felt. I actually have a personal friend who is homeless, and as we know, the issues of homelessness are multifaceted. And one time when he was able to pay to get a shower, he went into the local convenience store, and the person behind the counter said, now that he had cleaned up a little bit, oh, you look almost human now, as if someone loses his or her humanity simply because that person is homeless. Moving forward, how does unconscious bias work when we're dealing with young children? I mentioned early on that our thoughts are oftentimes programmed by our exposures, whether it's media, our schools, our families, our neighborhoods, our communities. This is a fantastic book that I would highly recommend. It's by Shankar Vedantam called Hidden Brain, How Our Unconscious Minds Elect Presidents, Control Markets, Wage Wars, and Save Our Lives. So this is a brief story of Alex, Joel, and Zachariah. This is a picture book. And the characters of Alex and Joel are little boys who happen to be white, and Zachariah is also a little boy who happens to be black. This picture book was read to a group of kindergartners in Montreal in a neighborhood that was very racially and ethnically diverse, very multicultural. The parents identified politically as liberal. And as the story was read, this is how the story goes. So Alex, Joel, and Zachariah got together for a sleepover. But they decided to go out on a raft on a uh, lake. As they were out there on the lake, their raft drifted out to sea, and a crocodile came along and knocked over the raft, knocking all three boys, Alex, Joel, and Zachariah, into the water. Alex and Joel's first response was, we must kill the crocodile. However, Zachariah knew that this crocodile was an endangered species, and he said, no, no, we can't kill the crocodile. We must save him. But he was a smart little boy, so first thing he did was help to right the raft. He helped Alex and Joel get atop the raft. Then he tied the snout shut of the crocodile, and he helped to get all of them ashore, including the crocodile. So when they went back home for the sleepover while Alex and Joel were sleeping, Zechariah stayed up most of the evening online 
sending letters, emails to the president and various conservation agencies on how we had to do more to save the crocodile. When they asked the children to state who was the hero of the story, everyone was surprised that the students did not state that Zachariah was the hero of the story. They actually said that Alex and Joel were the heroes of the story. And basically the fact that Alex and Joel kind of just tagged along and didn't do much, those properties were assigned to Zachariah instead. And you'll remember that at the beginning I said this was a picture book. So the fact that you had two white characters and a black character, somehow these perceptions influenced their response at the end. Of course their parents were horrified because, wait, we, we haven't taught our children this, where are they getting this from? Well, I don't go into great detail about this study in this presentation, but some of you may have heard of the Dahl study. And they've been doing this study many, many years since the 1940s. And what they do is they have very young children, about the same age as these children. They're four and five year olds. And they have them look at black dolls and white dolls. And they ask the children to basically describe the dolls. And the white doll is given many more positive properties than the black doll. And it's heart wrenching to see the black, the little black children basically saying negative things about the black doll. But what is stunning is when they then ask the black children, which doll do you look like? You can really see them hesitate because if I have now just said that the black doll is ugly, it's stupid, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, if I identify with the black doll, does that mean those properties basically are applicable to me as well? So again, young children are impacted by unconscious bias. What about the media and criminality? So you may recall some of these pictures. Hurricane Katrina was 10 years ago. And uh, the media portrayed uh, what happened in a very interesting light. So at the top here, we have a young black male. And it says, a young man walks through chest deep flood water after looting a grocery store in New Orleans. However, the picture on the right has two white residents. And they're described as two residents wade through chest deep water after finding bread and soda from a local grocery store. Now, What's interesting is, is unless the bread, orange juice, and soda floated up to them in the water, they might have been at the same convenience store that the young black man was at. However, this was portrayed in a very, very different light. At the picture at the bottom, we have a young um, white female who's walking along with a bag. And as you can see, the convenience store is closed. The window is broken. And so she's described as, as one person looks through their shopping bag left, Another jumps through a broken window while leaving a convenience store on the I-10 service road south in Metairie, Louisiana. So I guess they're not assigning as much criminality to the white female on the left, but being that the other person's jumping through the broken window, you can kind of imply who is perceived to be engaged in criminal behavior. Continuing with the theme of media and criminality, on the left, uh, this was interesting. This was in Iowa earlier this year. All six of these individuals had engaged in burglaries. The three black males on the top, their mug shots were put in the newspaper. The three white males on the bottom were wrestlers at Iowa State University, and their high school yearbook photos were used. When a few people contacted the local newspaper and asked, well, why is, the difference, why is there such a difference in depiction? Why did you use yearbook photos versus mug shots? Initially, the response was, well, there's a special process we have to go through to get the mug shots. And then the question was, well, why did you get mug shots for one and not mug shots for the other? So after receiving some heat for this, you see the after picture where two of the individual's mug shots were actually published. So again, when you see certain images and certain people are viewed as engaging more criminal behavior, people start to internalize that. So how does this work? Again, in everyday life, loss of innocence of children and criminality. This is a study from the American Psychological Association that came out in 2014. What's very interesting about this study is that um, there was a survey taken of several thousand people. And what they were talking about is perceptions of children, white children, specifically males, so white males versus black males. Up until the age of 10, the perceptions of innocence were pretty much the same. However, after age 10, black male children were perceived to be four and a half years older than their white counterparts. So when we think of all the uh, police shootings and police brutality, I'll think specifically of Tamir Rice, the 12 year old in Cleveland, a little over a year ago. So he was 12 years old and he was about 5'9", 190 pounds. But although he was 12 years old, if this study holds true, 
the police officers would have perceived him to be 16 or 17 years old, so more of a threat per se. How does unconscious bias work in everyday life? Again, criminality. Um, the, I have to say, everyday media is fodder for this topic. So if I go through these, these are all three students. So on the left, we have Taylor Wilson. And he was nicknamed the boy who played with Fusion. He's now a college student. He basically was able to get a hold of radioactive materials. And he was um, basically conducting experiments in his backyard. And he you know, went on to college. Um, he's still a college student. He's doing very well. Um, at the bottom, we have Kira Wilmot, who was a Florida high school student, and um, she was engaged in a science experiment in the high school. The experiment went awry, I think it was bleach and some other chemicals, and basically she was expelled because it was thought that she did this on purpose. They were trying to um, charge her with felony destruction of property. She was expelled and had to go to an alternative school until she graduated from high school. She is now in college as well, but she was treated very differently than Taylor Wilson. And then you may remember back in early September, Ahmed Mohammed, and I think that was in Texas. Um, he was the kid who brought the clock to school that he had made at home, and he was arrest arrested in front of his schoolmates, expelled, and actually now he and his family moved out of the United States altogether. So we tend to treat certain children one way, whereas other students are treated very differently. This plays into a lot of things, especially when we're talking about the school-to-prison pipeline. We know that disproportionately children of color are um, expelled from school as early as preschool. And so when you have certain children engaging in certain activities, sometimes they're given a pass or it's considered normal behavior, whereas if other students do it, it's considered disruptive, disrespectful. And so those children aren't given the same opportunity, um, basically, to redeem themselves. So if we look on the left, this is from school to prison versus on the right from foster care to prison, we have huge disparities and some of this is probably due to unconscious bias. And when I talk about what we can do as organizations at the very end, keep this in mind as well. Because some of you have probably heard the term mass incarceration. I happen to be I'm speaking to you from Maryland and when we're talking about the war on drugs, one thing I've seen is here in Maryland the black population is 30% of the population, but when we look at the data, 90% of those sent to prison for drugs are blacks. And we're having a huge issue now with heroin and now we're seeing a call for a kinder, gentler approach to how we approach heroin, which is not the same approach that was used in the war on drugs where we're talking about crack versus cocaine and the disproportionate sentencing. So as Hank mentioned at the beginning, there is huge unconscious bias when it comes to hiring. So the Chicago resume study this was a study where resumes were sent out. They had identical credentials, experience, but they were sent out, some having what would be white-sounding names versus black-sounding names. And what they found is that the resumes with white-sounding names were 50% more likely to actually receive an interview versus those with black-sounding names. We could probably take this a step further. I know other studies have done this, but if you have a so-called foreign-sounding name, again, you're at a disadvantage because in many realms you might not be called for an interview. Applicant pool composition. This was an interesting study where they looked and they found that if there were fewer than 25 percent women in an applicant pool, women were less likely to be hired for the position. So when we're talking about diversity in our applicant pools, whether we're talking about in academic settings, what we're talking about in our everyday settings, we really need to make sure that we have diversity, whether it's racial, ethnic, gender, age, etc. Social media biases. So basically this is talking about things such as your Facebook page, your Twitter account, your LinkedIn page. And this was a study of HR managers. And HR managers, before they decide to interview someone or to basically issue a candidate an offer for employment, they would look at someone's social media pages. And no, this wasn't just looking at was someone doing shots or hanging out at the bar or engaging in illegal behavior. But it was using things against candidates such as, oh, I don't really like that person's religious affiliation or political affiliation. Or basically, all those illegal questions that you can't ask during an interview, if you're looking at someone's social media page, you can often find out that information. So, oh, that person has children. Oh, I don't want to hire a woman who has children. She won't be as committed to the job. Or, oh, I didn't realize that person was gay. Oh, I don't really want to hire a gay person. So there were a whole host of issues associated with this. Studies have looked at overweight and obese applicants and employees, and what they found is 
that overweight and obese applicants are less likely to receive interviews. What's interesting is this effect carries over even to those who sit next to the overweight or obese applicants. This was a study where they kind of did a secret shopper. They had, um, they had applicants sit next to an overweight or obese person. The overweight and obese applicant wasn't called back, and neither was the applicant who was a normal size who um, sat next to that overweight or obese person. And then once overweight and obese um, employees actually are hired, they tend to remain at lower levels of the organization. They actually receive less pay. They are reprimanded more frequently, more likely to be dismissed, and basically because there were all kinds of assumptions made about that, that person's abilities, which have nothing to do with the job, but it's simply based upon one's physical appearance. The interesting thing about this, though, is that what I just said applies more so to females than it does to men. Something similar to that would be when we look at newscasters. What happens when a newscaster is female and she's perceived to no longer be very attractive for the viewing audience? So you can be an older male and you're still kept aboard, but if you're not viewed as being attractive and you're a female, you're out the door and we replace you with someone younger. There's unconscious bias when it comes with those with criminal records. So we've all heard of felony disenfranchisement, meaning someone who has a felony has an extremely difficult time getting a job. But in addition to the job market, one is not eligible for affordable housing, Section 8 housing, food stamps, Pell Grants, ineligible to vote in many states. But this does not just apply to those with felonies. Someone with a misdemeanor or a simple misdemeanor, open case, or no matter what the charge was, that can prevent someone from getting a job as well. The problem with this, though, is that those with criminal records, if we want to keep them from ending up back in prison, we do need to give them opportunities. And if you can't get a job, joblessness can basically become homelessness. And then you maybe have to revert back to whatever you were before to survive. And so when people end up back in prison and we blame them solely, we need to look at the systems in place that put them back there. Because, yes, it's choices, but choices based upon what they no longer have access to. Those with poor credit histories. Several states have passed laws where one's credit history cannot be used as a de determination when you are hiring someone. And we tend to think of poor credit history as, oh, this person simply made poor buying choices or poor choices financially. But one could have to uh, basically file for bankruptcy due to a medical illness. Or it could be that you lost your job and you've been out of work for several years and you lose your home, your home is foreclosed upon. So again, these people will most likely need the employment even more than someone else, but they're discriminated against because of unconscious bias against them because of their poor credit history. People with accents. So in reality, every single person has an accent. So, but we tend to focus upon those who have what we will call a perceived foreign accent. So oftentimes people will tune people out who have foreign accents, they question their abilities, or they add other questions on there. Well, you have a foreign accent. Are you actually a U.S. citizen? Or are you here legally? Or are you undocumented? Or are you a permanent resident? So oftentimes those with foreign accents have difficulty getting jobs. But it doesn't just apply to those with foreign accents. I actually have a colleague who is a nursing executive. She has a doctorate, multiple certifications, etc. behind her name. However, she's originally from the South, and she has a very, very heavy Southern drawl. And she has said that having that Southern drawl has really held back her career because if someone speaks to her on the phone, the assumptions they make about her based upon her Southern drawl is very evident. Those with disabilities. So as we know, those with disabilities tend to be underemployed. We still make assumptions about one's intelligence based upon one's able-bodied status, and this is talking about physical disabilities. But we also have people with invisible mental disabilities as well. And so oftentimes, they are not included in the workforce, or even when they are in the workforce, they're concentrated in certain levels of employment and not promoted appropriately. And then lastly, those who are LGBTQI, so lesbian and gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, or intersex. There are all kinds of assumptions that are made about people who fall into this umbrella category. And what many may, know, may not know is that there are no federal protections to prevent people who are LGBTQI from being dismissed from their employer, so um, workplace discrimination. Um, there is still discrimination based in housing or public accommodations. So again, I have several colleagues who, yes, they happen to be gay or lesbian, but because of the state in which they work, they cannot be out because they could actually lose their jobs because of it. So let's turn now to microaggressions. 
This is a great book by Dr. Daryl Wing Sue at Columbia Teachers College, Microaggressions in Everyday Life, Race, Gender, and Sexual Orientation. Microaggressions are comments that are meant to be a compliment, but actually they're really a backhanded way of saying something, and the person who's saying it might not intend harm, but it's really a barb or a jab, and the person who's the recipient of that comment usually is very hurt by it, and I'll give you a couple of examples. It could be, so an Asian graduate student is told by his advisor, you speak English so well. Yet that Asian student was born here in the United States, so why wouldn't that person speak English well? Or if you're a person of color, implying that that person only was hired for a position because of affirmative action and not because of his or her credentials. Or saying um, to someone who is disabled, oh, I don't see your disability, you know, so, or saying to someone, you know, a person of color, oh, you speak so well, you are so articulate, and the thing is, is when people make these kinds of comments, basically what it's saying is, well, you're okay, or you're an exception, but all those other people in your group, not so much. So, um, th I thought this was a great um, little cartoon because it illustrates some examples, some further examples of microaggressions. So on the left, we have someone who I would perceive to be a white, so white female, various ages. On the left, it would be a person of color who's a female. So on the top, we have someone who asks the woman who's holding a baby, uh, is that your little brother? Versus, oh, is that your son? So for one person, you know, because she looks young, it's more likely to be her little brother versus, oh, this other woman looks young, and so she probably is a teenage mom. So an assumption that's being made. Here we have the PE teacher talking to two senior students, and he says to one, what colleges have you applied to? Versus the person on the right, he asks her, will you be the first person in your family to graduate high school? You can imagine the sting of that. The next person, these are college students. What's your major? Versus, are you the first person in your family to go to college? Now we're in the workplace. Do you have any kids? Versus, how many kids do you have? And then lastly on the bottom, from a healthcare perspective, the, this could be a physician, a nurse practitioner, an advanced practice nurse, and nurse um, uh, physician assistant. What does your husband do? And I will note, you probably can't see it, but both women happen to be wearing wedding bands. And she asks the woman on the right, with a bit of a frown, is the father still in the picture? On top of that, she's making some other assumptions as well, because she's assuming that both women, that the woman on the left is married, but how does she know she doesn't have a same-sex spouse? She could have a wife, she could have a domestic partner. So again, assumptions people make based upon one's appearance. So how can we combat unconscious bias? So um, I think in the information that was sent out, we had asked that if you could, to go to the implicit association test and take a few of the tests. So the implicit association test is part of Project Implicit. The two colleagues who I mentioned early on, uh, Dr. Greenwald, Dr. Banaji, this is their huge project that they've been working on. And so the way it works is it shows how your conscious and your unconscious minds diverge, meaning where are the gaps, where are the differences. And so, as I mentioned, it's a collaboration between colleagues at Harvard University, the University of Virginia, and the University of Washington. And again, it's basically meant for us to identify for self-education and self-awareness because it's called unconscious or implicit or hidden bias because you don't know that you have these biases. However, when you get into certain situations, this unconscious bias comes about, whether it's a hiring situation or you're about to get on an elevator and, oh, Okay, I don't want to get on the elevator with that person, or you cross, your, you cross the street, or you clutch your purse, or all kinds of different things. So, what do our results tell? What do the results tell us? Well, they've been doing this for many years, and in this case, this was on the black, white, or the race IAT. And what they found is, is that 70% of people, black, white, everyone, had some sort of preference for white people compared to black people. And what's interesting about this is that there's a little warning that comes with this. As I said, this is meant for self-education, self-awareness. I would never advocate, if you're a hiring manager, having people complete various implicit association tests and based upon their performance that they would have to share with you, you would decide to make a hiring decision because this is personal information. And once you find out about your biases, the next step is what do you actually do about those biases. 
So some of the findings are is that they're pervasive, they're everywhere. Basically, if you're a breathing, a living, breathing human being, we all have unconscious biases and probably multiple unconscious biases. However, because they're hidden, they're unknown, you're unaware of them, and they can predict behaviors. So think of those examples I mentioned where if you perceive one group to be more valuable than another group, that will dictate your hiring decision. And people can differ in their levels of implicit bias based upon their experiences, their exposures, etc. So before I move on to the science of unconscious bias, I try to explain to people that even though I do this work 24-7 and this is my passion, uh, every single person, I said, living human being has biases. I'm going to share two with you and you can think about where you may have some biases as well. So I was out on election day last November knocking on doors, trying to help get out the vote. I would ask people, ma'am, sir, have you voted today? Well, I encountered a young black male, and I said, oh, sir, have you voted today? And he said, oh, no, I, I can't vote. So what unconscious bias do you think jumped to mind? So here I am, a black woman, and what immediately jumped to mind was, oh, he must have a record. He must have a felony, so he's unable to vote. Well, I stopped to chat further, and what I found out is, no, the reason why he was unable to vote is he immigrated from Jamaica eight years ago, and he's a permanent resident but not a U.S. citizen. So you can imagine how horrible I felt because here I do this work, but I can't beat myself up about it. I just need to be more conscious of that. The only good thing that came out of that situation is I actually sit on a board that works for the immigrant community. We provide citizenship classes, filling out the application, etc. I gave him the number to that organization, but I still felt terrible about the, the um, situation. Um, the other situation is that I was on vacation earlier this year in Cancun with my kids. We climbed atop one of the Mayan ruins, and an older woman said, hey, would you like me to take a picture of you and your family? And I didn't quite jump at her offer. And I said, oh, well, yeah, thank you, but no, I was actually going to ask this other person over here who happened to be a young man. The young man took the picture, but he wasn't very enthusiastic about it. And then when I thought about this encounter, I'm like, oh, my gosh. I was like, that's awful. I was like, you know why I didn't have her take the picture? Because I pretty much assumed that perhaps she, you know, had problems with technology, but she actually was a nice person and she offered. So those are just two examples of unconscious biases that I've noticed within myself, and I do this work. So I really do try to check myself so that basically it won't predict behavior. So there's a whole science of unconscious bias. So um, the two colleagues I mentioned, Dr. Amar Banaji and Dr. Greenwald, they have really taken their work from the implicit association test and put it into lay person's terms with this fantastic book, Blind Spot, Hidden Biases of Good People. Because that's another take home point is we all have unconscious biases. It does not mean that you're a bad person. It doesn't mean if you scored poorly on the race IT, you're an, a racist or a bigot or, you know, prejudice, et cetera, et cetera. But what it means is, gee, maybe I need to rethink how I interact with people and how how are ways that I can actually have real relationships or more substantive relationships with different kinds of people? There's a great, there's a center and basically the Kerwin Institute and they put out this annual report, they've been doing this since 2013, called State of the Science Implicit Bias Review and they look through all the different literature talking about the issue of implicit, hidden, or unconscious bias. And then from a healthcare perspective, Dr. Augustus White is a retired orthopedic surgeon from Harvard and he wrote a book uh, several years ago called Seeing Patients, Unconscious Bias, and Healthcare. So we know that from a neuroscience perspective, as I said, every single human being has unconscious bias. So does this mean that there's just nothing we can do? We should just throw up our hands in disgust and just walk away and say, oh, well, we have unconscious biases. Let it continue how we behave. Let it continue to skew our interactions with others. Well, no. We know, again, there is neuroscience behind unconscious bias but we actually need to do something about it. So I'll start with some debiasing techniques, and that State of the Science report from 2015 was fantastic with these suggestions. So the first thing is, as I mentioned earlier, it, you, it's important not to beat yourself up about the fact that you discovered you have some sort of bias. So that guilt that I even felt, I, beating myself up about it isn't going to help. However, acting differently because I'm aware of that bias is extremely important for moving forward. So some debiasing techniques are training. So something like this webinar or going to other unconscious bias sessions or just learning more about other kinds of people, other kinds of groups. Group contact. This is very important, but the caution behind this is intergroup contact, 
you know, we know that in our workplaces and in our schools in general and many of our other public places or public spaces, they tend to be fairly, many are fairly diverse. But at the end of the day, we tend to go back to our own communities, so sometimes there isn't the opportunity to have substantive conversations or even substantive relationships to learn more about other people. Oftentimes there's a fear, well, I can't talk to that person because we have nothing in common, or I might say this, the wrong thing and that person will be offended. Well, if we don't have those conversations, we can't move forward. But with this whole issue of intergroup contact, it can't just be with one person from any group because what happens is we tend to exceptionalize that one person from the group. So it could be, I have a gay friend. Great, you might be fine with that one gay friend, but you don't like gay people as a whole. Or, oh, you're not like those other gay people, which is oftentimes what happens. It's really having meaningful relationships and meaningful conversations with more than one person from that group. And also, too, because that one person isn't representative of the entire group. Having empathy or taking the perspective of others. Because oftentimes when we have these crucial or difficult conversations, when someone brings up their experience from whatever perspective they're coming from, there's a tendency for many people, if you haven't gone through that experience, to downplay or discount that person's experience. Well, I didn't experience it. That can't possibly happen. So if you basically practice empathy and use the perspective of someone else, it will definitely help you with this issue. Emotional expression. As you saw in that cartoon, basically body language is extremely key. So people can sense when, you know, mm, there's an issue here. So again, if you are as friendly with everyone as you are with people of a certain group, that will come across and that can help build trust in relationships. And then lastly, having counter stereotypical exemplars. So if in your mind, so I'll use my example of unconscious bias. So if in my mind, I have this assumption or bias that young black males tend to have felony records, well then, if I'm exposed to young black males who don't have felony records, who don't have criminal records at all, that helps to counterbalance the stereotype that I've been fed by the media, etc. So some take-home points is remember at the beginning I said that I was focusing on this really more so from an individual level rather than from an organizational or systems level. So what are, think of what are some implications for unconscious bias in your own work and practice. So I said at the beginning, when we talk about cultural competency training, unconscious bias oftentimes is not included as part of that. So we can think to incorporate unconscious bias into our overall cultural competency trainings or diversity and inclusion trainings. And then we really need to look at this from a systems level or an institutional bias level, meaning look at the policies, procedures, and practices. Are they applied fairly and evenly? And I'm giving you a couple of examples of areas where this can be key because of the consequences that result. So in our criminal justice system, whether I was talking about the disproportionate sentencing for crack versus cocaine, powdered cocaine, the school to prison pipeline, the foster care to prison pipeline, things like that. Health and health care, very crucial. Employment, when I talked about hiring issues. Education, are certain students more apt to be in the gifted and talented programs versus special education? Do we have the same expectations for all students, or do we assume that because someone's from a certain socioeconomic background, that person has no hope of going to college, so we just won't put any effort into that person? Or that person's parent doesn't come to the parent-teacher association meetings and doesn't come to parent-teacher conferences, so that parent doesn't care, so I'm not going to invest into this child. Housing. Basically, another area where on paper, yes, everything is equal, but again, when we look at the pattern of segregation in this country, are people able to find adequate, affordable housing, and is it accessible in all areas? So, putting up my contact information, if anyone would like to discuss this further. And we're going to open it up for Q&A if there are any questions, but before we do that, um, I just want to remind everyone that we do have an online presence. Uh, please visit us at our website. We have a Facebook page, we have a Twitter account, and we also have a LinkedIn group. And I'll turn it back over to Hank. Great, thank you very much, Cherie. Um, a couple of the questions that we had were about um, sector-specific um, uh, bias training. So, for example, some of the some of the things that you had mentioned touched around you know, children and some studies and stuff that they're done. So there was a question about. Um, um, you know, by unconscious bias and that that kind of training related to education, like 
either for teachers or that takes place in the school system. Are you aware of any sort of sector specific um, training that addresses some of these issues? Um, I I don't know of any specific ones. Among my colleagues, I've heard people talking about this exact issue. Um, I would have to do a little research on that, reaching out to some of my colleagues. And if we have that person's contact information, I could reach back out to the person. But um, not in the educational realm. I know that there has been some unconscious bias training for law enforcement. So, for example, uh, Tim Wise, who some may be aware of, um, he's an anti-racism advocate based in, I believe, Nashville, Tennessee. Um, he speaks nationally, and there's a documentary called Cracking the Codes. And he talks about his experience working with law enforcement and a lot of the unconscious bias that comes into play there. And talking about how this is really crucial as part of the police academy training. Because, as we said, this predicts behavior. So if you assume certain people are more likely to have drugs, well, you're going to pull over certain cars versus other cars. So it is very important to um, have this training in various sectors. Sure. One of the other areas they mentioned was media. Do you know uh, uh, those those examples that you mentioned about the the pictures from the the media were really good? Do you, are there any? Do you, are you aware of any studies or books out there that kind of get at that um, uh, those issues of bias in the media? Uh, I'm not. But what's interesting is, is I think by people making the media in general aware of these issues, hopefully that will come. But it's really hard when you're doing it on an individual basis. So when you contact, you know, news station or one radio station, that doesn't get to the entire sector. Um, and the other thing is when people do raise these issues, there is a tendency, again, to discount that there's bias based upon these lines. So I think training would be fantastic but I'm not personally aware of any at this time. Uh, great. Those are some of the questions that we had. We're getting near the end of the time. <clears throat> One of the other questions was, can you uh, go back to your slide with the contact information? Mm -hmm. Yes. Great. Thank so they, Because some people, it seems like they want to follow up with you, so they uh, send in some questions about that. Um, great. Well, again, we have reached the time. I want to be sensitive to everyone else's time. So on behalf of the, NJS, the NJSNCC, I'd like to thank Sheree very much for a great uh, webinar, very eye-opening and very informative. And we'd also like to thank everyone for attending. And I want to remind you that this uh, webinar will be archived and made available uh, on our website. Uh, when the webinar is over, please don't forget to complete the survey that will pop up. So don't, you know, don't leave right away. You've got to wait a second or so and another screen will pop up. If you could please answer that survey, we would uh, um, uh, appreciate it. And then just as a reminder that um, this is uh, a part of a webinar series uh, and we are planning uh, some additional webinars in the spring. Um, we, have ten, we don't have uh, exact dates yet, but we're, the next one should be sometime in February. Uh, so please look out for that. So I want to thank you very much, and we're going to uh, end now, and I hope everyone has a great day.